Greetings in the wonderful name of Jesus. We are giving God thanks for another day, a day to be in the land of the living, where we can experience the mercies, and the grace and the provision and the protection that God has bestowed upon us another day. And so we acknowledge and salute our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to our associate pastors online tonight and their respective families, all of our officers, brothers and sisters, and especially those who are visiting with us. It is great to have you. This is the Bethel United Church of Jesus Christ Apostolic, the Portmore Assembly. Great to have you joining with us. And should it be your joining with us further into the future, let me also extend greetings and welcome in Jesus' wonderful name. <clears throat> Stay with us as we share in the word of Almighty God. We're reminded that the times in which we live are evil times, perilous times, last days. And amidst these trying times, God is still in control and God is still blessing his people. He did say that in the last day, he will pour out of his spirit upon all flesh. And so while it is the last days and there are trying times that we're experiencing, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is also available to one and all. And we give God thanks for his mercies, even in the face of perilous times in the name of the Lord. We have with us tonight, and those who came along with him, a special guest who is going to be sharing the word of God with us tonight. No stranger to us. He has been here working, uh, ministering online with us before, and we're certainly glad to have him in the name of the Lord. I refer to Minister Andrew, Elder Andrew Martin. He has been saved for over 25 years and is an elder of the Faith Chapel of Faith Apostolic Ministry located in Kingston, Jamaica. He's a graduate of the University of Technology where he holds a bachelor's in science degree in computer, computing and information technology and a diploma in sacred theology from the Caribbean Bible Institute. Currently, he lectures in the era of biblical hermeneutics and Bible study methods, Christian apologetics, and Bible prophecy at Faith Bible College. In 2014 and through to 2016, Minister Martin, Elder Martin, has mission, did mission works in Kenya and Tanzania, where he engaged in a lot of teaching and preaching, especially in areas of evangelism and apostolic doctrine. Bethel Portme. Portmore, help me to welcome this very evening, my friend and brother, Elder Andrew Martin, and those who came with him. God bless you, Elder, in Jesus' wonderful name. Come on in. Amen. God bless you, sir. Want to greet everybody in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. It's a privilege to be here tonight. Amen. One more time with you at Bethel Portmore. Amen. And, I, and all the time, I esteem it a privilege to, to be here. Amen. And and to be honest, I mean, when I enter my minister at Minister Romano Willis Church, praise God, hello Willis, I, I, I must say um, I'm a bit intimidated. This man is a teacher. He was my teacher. Yeah, he's shaking his head, amen. And um, he taught me in Bible school a couple of years back in um, the Tabernacle. So I know he's an excellent teacher and a good friend of mine over the years, for years, amen. I want to greet everybody, all the saints, Pastor Willis, I mean, assistant pastors, our elders, praise God, and all the ministers, all the saints, praise God, all the visitors. I want to greet you in the mighty name of Jesus. How good, the Bible says, and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So tonight, I'm here to share the word of God with us tonight, and I pray, God, that we will be blessed. Uh, my screen sharing is disabled, Sir Willis, so um, praise God. You may go ahead. You can go ahead. Martin. Thank you. Still, it says disabled. I guess if you meet me co-host, it works. You can go ahead now. Try again. All right. There we go. All right. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. So tonight we will speak on the topic. Amen. The end of all things is at hand. Praise God. And I did, yeah, I must tell you that Elder Willis 
gave me a free open door. Amen. <laughs> I pray God that as I did pray and I asked God where we should go and I believe that this is where we should go tonight. So let me start by saying, amen, that God wants us to know. It's important before we touch anything that we understand that God wants us to know his plan and he is in control. Amen. Nothing that is happening in this present time is taking, will take God by control at all or take him by surprise, I should say. God wants us as the church to know his plan. The Bible says, in Isaiah chapter 46, from verse 9 to 10, remember the former things of old. It says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. It says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall I stand and I will do all my pleasure. Then he went on to say in Amos, to the prophet Amos, that surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. So we can be assured that as saints of the most high God, God has, God don't want us to be in the uh, not knowing exactly of what is happening. God don't want these things to take us by surprise as it were. As the Bible said, we are not children of darkness, but we are children of the light, amen. Also I want us to understand that God reveals his plan to us through what is called predictive prophecy, amen. And by what is called progressive revelation. Praise God. I know that it is a learned church. So probably when I use terms, I probably don't have to explain and define. But predictive prophecy speaks to future prophecy, things that, that, that come predictive. Progressive revelation speaks to the fact that God progressively, as the term suggests, uh, reveals himself to us over time. Amen. And, and we know that's how God deals with us as Christians. Praise God. There are, there, are, there are some things we don't know. Amen. We are we get a little knowledge of what God is doing, but he progressively reveals himself to us. And therefore, there are some things we don't know today, but by tomorrow we'll understand or we understand why God led us in that particular direction. Amen. And we can look at, for example, the what is called the mountain peak of prophecy. And that practically says that God sometimes give us a general plan and that's what he did with the prophets. They were able to see the peaks of what were supposed to come. But at the same time, while we are looking at what is called the mountain peak of prophecy, if you stay on a mountain peak and you look across, there are some things you might miss. So I want us as we look at these things tonight that we don't major in minor things. I am presently um, realize that there has been a lot of debate, both in church and out of church. There's issues, people saying COVID, people saying don't take vaccine, people saying this, people saying that. And we might just miss some things because we are we are not fully, uh, we, we see to a glass dim as the scripture says no, but there comes a time where we're going to see everything clearly. Amen. And, and, and we can remember from the Old, Test, Old Testament time, the, the people back then, it was their scripture, it was their scripture, Jewish Old Testament, the Tanakh. Uh, the law, the prophets, and the writings, the Torah, the Nevim, and the Ketuvim. It was their writings. And yet still, when Jesus came on the scene, the Bible said he came unto his own, and his own received him not. In other words, the same set of people that had that word, amen, and they were looking, and they expected something. They missed something. So while we are talking prophecy, we cannot be dogmatic, uh, because there might be something that we have not seen, and we have to constantly ask God to reveal more and more to us as we go along, amen. I'm, I'm always willing to learn and to unlearn, amen. I, I, for example, Minister Willis mentioned hermeneutics. Amen. I, I always tell my students, if I be lifted up from this earth, I will draw all men unto me. We say that in praise and worship, but I've unlearned that to know that it doesn't speak to praise and worship, but it speaks to the fact that Jesus was lifted on the cross. Amen. And therefore, the Bible itself tell you plainly, as he was talking about, he speaks in the context of his death. In other words, how he was on the cross, through the cross. Amen. Through his dying on the cross, he will pull all men to himself. So as we study scriptures, we learn Amen. And sometimes we have to unlearn and learn again. Amen. So we are not dogmatic, but at the same time, we believe that God has given us enough information, praise God, in this season for us to be ready and ready waiting. So my key verse is Matthew 24, 1 to 14. And it says, praise God, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple and his disciples came up to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do ye not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, and I'm reading from the New King James Version, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, 
when shall these things be and what shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Praise God. The Bible went on to say, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you or no one deceive you. And I'm going to I highlight that because I'm leaving that part for last. I, I, it, it, it has burned my heart for what has been happening in the church setting. So I left that part um, because I want to focus a bit on the church and the body of Christ. It said, for many will come in my name saying, I am Christ and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. It says, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and will kill you and you will be hated by nations for my name's sake and then many will be offended and will betray one another and will hate one another then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and because lawlessness will abound the love of many will grow cold but he who endures to the end the same shall be saved and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. Now, I must first let us understand that I'm fully aware that Matthew 24 um, speaks in context, and I fully understand that it speaks in context mainly to what will happen to the Jews, to Israel uh, during the Great Tribulation period. If you study it, it was really talking about um, God dealing, how God's dealing with Israel. So I'm fully aware of that. However, God did highlight some things in that, and we understand how, how it works. Um, we are not going to just wake up tomorrow and start say like we know that like, today is ending because earthquake has increased and and famine increased. I believe that over time we will see this thing progressively come. As I said before, it progressively reveals in a similar way. It progressively intensifies. Amen. And and I can remember. Um, I think there's a scripture we talk about birth pains in the sense that. Um, I remember when um, my wife was practically having a child, amen, and, and, and initially there was, you start feel a little pain first, and, and cerebrals cannot test that. You feel a little thing, and then eventually if the, the, the pain become closer and closer and more and more intense. In other words, it start with one thing, and I say, boy, I feel it, I, I know it's coming, but it can give some time. So you start test how far apart these things are and it gets closer and closer and closer and closer because we know something is coming in a similar way all the signs that jesus mentioned here in matthew 24 amen as we come close and closer amen to the revelation of jesus christ i mean we're going to realize that things are going to intensify. praise god so my first thing to say is we want to define praise god what is the last days because we're talking about now being the last days, we want to look at what the scriptures actually mean as relates to the last days. So we are living in the last days. I must first say that we are living in the last days. And the last days in, in a general, is a general period of time. And in the whole plan of God, it speaks to a part in history where God is going to start dealing directly with the church right up to his revelation. And the reason why I said this, because if you can remember, the Apostle Peter also declared that we are living in the last days, which means that the last days didn't start two years ago or didn't start 10 years ago. And it speaks to how God operates. Amen. From Peter's time, Peter is saying, this know also that in the last days, and he went on. And just to prove that point, in Acts chapter 2, from verse 14 to 19, we see Peter say, but Peter standing up with 11. And we know this was the day of Pentecost when they got the Holy Ghost. Praise God. And we know the Bible says about verse 13, others were mocking, saying these men are full of new wine. And Peter, standing up with 11, lifted up his voice and said unto men, ye men of Judea and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken to my words. Praise God. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. In other words, it's just nine o'clock in the morning. The people don't normally drink so early. Amen. But he said, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. So from Joel time, Joel prophesied that it shall come to pass in the last day, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And he was making reference, linking it back to the experience that took place in Acts chapter 2 from verse 1 to 4 when they got the Holy Ghost. Amen. So if you really think about it, the last day 
Amen. Started at that point in time where the Holy Ghost was poured out. Amen. So from that period of time where men got the Holy Ghost and they were all through the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Amen. As the Spirit gave the utterance, they are ushered in, praise God, the beginning of the last days. But as I said before, as you come closer and closer, we're going to see things getting um, intensified. Amen. As we go along. Now to give us a better pictorial of what was taking place. You can remember in, uh, I think, Daniel chapter 2, amen, where Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about an image and he saw an image of gold, and the head was of gold, the arms were of silver, um, the, the tie was of brass, and the legs was of iron, praise God, and he did talk about the feet with iron mixed with clay, and he did say a stone that is going to be cut out of the mountain, not made with hand, is going to smash, uh, hit the, the image at the feet, and it's going to uh, roll and take over, as it were. But if you really look at it, all of these speaks to what is called uh, the times of the Gentiles, praise God. And the time of the Gentiles started from the Babylonian kingdom came into place. So the head of gold represented Babylon. I'm not going into that, but I just wanted to make, make reference to something. The Medo Persia uh, was the second one who took over from the Babylonians, amen. Then the Grecians under Alexander the Great, and then you have the Romans. But can I tell you that there has been a six, a, like a gap between that part and the feet, which is the iron mixed with clay. So uh, if you really look at it, this period of time where the church is, this period of time is what we call the last days. So the last day started after Christ crucified and the church came into being. Amen. The next event, amen, that would have been in this uh, period of time is the rapture. Now, the truth be told, you might ask, so what are the signs that would point to the rapture? There are no signs to the rapture. Amen. The, the rapture, that's what makes the rapture imminent. However, what we can do, we can look and realize that things are happening, but these are not necessarily signs per se to point to the fact that the rapture is going to take place. What these are signs for us as children of God to realize that, look here, there is something that is going to happen. Amen. But there's nothing in scripture that says, uh, this is going to do, and for the rapture could have taken place five years ago, it's going to take place 10 years ago, amen, but God has a specific time, amen, when he's going to call his people out, amen, but the end, uh, the last day speaks to this period of time, the period of time where uh, the, Jesus was crucified, where the church started, the Holy Ghost started, amen, right to the end of the 70th week, the last days. So the last is the final period of time before the second coming of the Lord, the final dispensation or the time of the Messiah. Amen. Now, if you can remember the scripture that we read, Jesus, however, did, as I said, make some reference to some things that he told his disciples about. And these are things that we can see happening in the world today. And we can clearly say, boy, um, we are seeing these things intensify, amen, from as time goes on. And this point clearly to the fact that we need to look up, amen, for our redemption, joint nine. So he spoke about false prophets, false Christ, amen. He spoke about wars, amen. He spoke about famine, praise God. He spoke about pestilence. He spoke about earthquake. He spoke about persecution of Christians. He spoke about the fiction from the faith. And, again, and this one I want to emphasize because this is where my heart is, amen. While we can look at the external things, there are some signs inside the house of God that we can look at as children of God that we need to get ourselves ready. Somebody quoted a scripture that was in my thing. And I said, boy, I, I know I'm in tune, amen. We talk about lawless and lack of love, amen. They talk about the gospel in preachers are worldwide. So he spoke about, and not the gospel there is the gospel of the kingdom and not the gospel of our salvation. But anyway, you take it in order for it to operate in a particular way it has to be a worldwide event and therefore there must be something in place that can push a worldwide event of this gospel the gospel of the kingdom praise god so let's just look back at what jesus actually said jesus said jesus answered and said to them take it that no man deceive you and he pointed out something so many will come in my name saying i am christ and I will, and will deceive many. He said, you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. So all the signs that we saw, we've seen it in this thing a while ago. You talk about famine. You talk about pestilence. You talk about earthquake in various places. Praise God. He spoke about they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. Mark, he was talking in reference to the Jews. But I believe in a similar sense, amen, we are going to see persecution happening even in the house of God. Amen. You talk about false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And, and this, this thing deceive us, you notice how many times it is emphasized over and over because this is a very high 
point for me. Amen. I'm very high point for the Lord Jesus Christ as well. Amen. It's talk about lawlessness will abound. I said the love of many will grow cold. He said, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness. Now let us look at some of these things uh, together and see what is happening. No, in the 18th century, amen, what has happened? We realize that things are beginning to intensify, amen, as it relates to people who claim themselves to be Christ. And the funny thing is that many people are deceived by them. In the 18th century, two persons made a claim that they were Christ. Amen. In the 19th century, six persons did it. In the 20th century, uh, 28 persons, we are now living in the 21st century, and six persons so far has made a claim. If you really look into uh, history, that I've made a claim that they are Christ. For example, this guy called Henry of Brazil, um, he said that, look here, he is the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. Amen. And you know the funny thing about it? He has many followers. This is him practically. And a lot of the followers, some of his followers around him. Amen. And he's sitting there and he's saying that he is the reincarnation. I would wonder. How do people buy this? But the scriptures already tell you that many are going to buy into this. Amen. We see this guy, uh, Viserion of Russia. And he also says that, look here, at, in 1990, he's at the age of 29. He said he got a revelation that he was the reincarnation of Jesus Christ. And he spoke publicly about his claim to people. And guess what? Many people start following the man. So this is the man at the front. I see him followers behind him. It's the line of people. Many following the man in Russia because this man is saying that he is Christ. Amen. That's a sign. And we see where it is intensifying. Amen. As we come closer and closer. There's a guy, I think, in, in Florida. Um, he died recently. He said that he was the Christ. Amen. And there are many that are coming out on the scene right now to claim that they are Christ. But I'm not, I'm not perturbed because guess what? There's going to come a man eventually, amen, who is going to come on the scene and he's going to solve all the issues, amen. And he is going to be worshipped as Christ, amen. But guess what? He's going to break a covenant and many of the Jews are going to realize that this man was never the Christ to be and then God will have to protect them. Praise God. But look at this now. The Bible also speaks of wars, amen. In the, in the time, the year 1000 to 1300, you had about five major wars. And this is taken from the Encyclopedia Britannica. Amen. I, I, you're looking at the research. I want to see how war has intensified. I put it on a graph. Amen. To see how, what has taken place over a period of time. So between this time and this time, you realize how many wars has increased. And, and, and trust me, if you are following the news, you realize that things are happening. Things are building up even on the other side of the world. You realize what is happening between China and Thailand, um, Taiwan right now. China is flying over Taiwan, amen, planes over the, over the country practically. Um, and Taiwan is saying, we are getting ready to war with you. So we are not giving up our, our, our country as it were. And Taiwan is saying, the mainland belongs to us. And the mainland is saying, Thailand is belong to us. And the US is practically have ships right now in that particular sea region. And Japan has ships over there. And UK has ships over there. And what they're doing, they're building up in solidation with Taiwan. But China has enough warship to on anything so the, if anything should go wrong right now is a big thing then we know the whole thing in north korea right now where there's an issue between the north koreans amen and and and, and what is happening with biden there's that is an argument amen that look here man if, if you if you think anything we, we we are ready to war right now and i mean i saw something recently too where biden was saying up to russia president that look here if you want war, we're ready to start it. So there is something that is building up. And this something tells me that this points to the red horse that is supposed to be to poured out. Amen. After the white horse come, the second one would have been the red horse. And the red horse is symbolic of war and bloodshed. Amen. So when you look at it, amen, the Antichrist comes, then instantly there's war. So all of these things that we are seeing happening in this side of the world is building up for another world war. Amen. Is this coincidence? Jesus spoke about it. Praise God. Then we see there's increase in famine. Now, famine is a little different because, because of what is happening. Um, we see where they, this is the only one that we see where there's a problem, a, a decrease over time. It has decreased, but the Bible clearly tells us that if there is going to be such a big war in the future, 
the next horse that was on the scene after the red horse was what? The black horse. And he had a scale in his hand. Amen. So what is going to happen is that eventually, I strongly believe, even though the graph here shows it at declining between from 1860 to present, praise God, there is going to, it's, something is building up. And the moment that there's a war, and the moment that there's a war, famine is going to come into place. But even before there's a war, I've been hearing that most of the stores, if, especially in the States, they are stocking up because they are anticipating there's a scarcity in what is happening. So most of the stores right now, they kind of anticipate that something is about to come. So uh, a friend of mine told me she went to a store and normally you could have buy like a big set of tissue, amen. But they're only selling you a small amount because they are stocking up and they're stocking up on this, this. The shelves don't look as packed as they used to be, amen. Something is going to happen, amen. And trust me, brethren, Jesus spoke about it. Then we talk about pestilence, I mean, and, and, and some of the things that has been increasing over time. We have seen an increase in heart disease, 8.8 .8 million deaths per year. We see an increase in stroke, 6.2 million deaths. Diabetes, 1.6 million deaths. There's a lot of people dying, um, praise God. And but guess what happened? Outside of that, we are seeing also some pandemics that have been taking place. Now, a pandemic is different than just a normal disease, as we are fully aware now of the COVID-19. Amen. But before the COVID-19, there were other pandemics that took place. For example, uh, the Black Death, amen, in, uh, in 1346 to 1353, where 75 to 200 million people died. Then you have third cholera pandemic, which had about 1 million dead. You had the Spanish flu, which killed about 20 to 50 million people. And we are fully aware that from 2019 to present, we have had COVID-19 and everybody is uncomfortable. That is the reason why we are on Zoom tonight. Praise God, because there's a lockdown and therefore nobody can go to church. So, but, but thank God for technology. You know, I thought about it and I said, Ella, if this thing happened when I was in high school, I don't know what happened to most saints because we couldn't find them. There was no Zoom. There was the technology. Remember your, your phone back in the day? We used to play snake on. Amen. Remember how big the phone before that look? Amen. But guess what? I strongly believe that God knew he wanted to preserve some people. And if you want to be serious about serving God, amen, God has opened a door in this season, amen, and we can get the word still. If this happened when I was in high school, many more people would have dropped out. And can I tell you something? What is surprising is that the COVID-19 um, this COVID-19 pandemic is separating the saints. We are seeing who is Christian and who is not. Amen. We are seeing who is serious and who is not. Amen. Yes. Because guess what, brethren? Brethren and sisters of the Most High God, I pray God that every person here would be ready and get themselves in a place because guess what? Something, it is pointing to something great. Then we see earthquake, praise God, from 2000, this is from about uh, 2000 to about 2009, um, 2010. Amen. And that's, that's the statistics that I get so far. But it shows a steady increase in earthquake over time. It means that they talk about um, climate change and all of these that are happening. And we see a lot of plate movements and tectonics. With recently, we had the earthquake in Haiti again, amen. And we ourselves felt it here. And you had, you had, you had some, so a lot of things that are happening in, in, in different, different parts of the world. A lot of earthquake that I think, and there's a steady increase over time as it relates to earthquake. So this is this a graph of showing the amount of earthquake that are happening over, uh, praise God, the earth. In, in, from that ten, time till now. So guess what happened? And not only that, while we're seeing a more frequent occurrence, I mean, annually, we're seeing an average of one earthquake that is eight, uh, magnitude eight and higher. Then we see between seven and 7 7.9, about 15 annually, yearly, and between six and 6.9. And trust me, an earthquake that is seven and 7.9, or even five, as low as five can cause great damage, amen. So don't look because it's not eight and above, amen. It just needs to be a four, five, and a lot of people can die. But we are seeing that there's a steady increase in frequency as it relates to earthquake. Then there's Christian persecution. And this is taken from uh, the BBC News. Christian persecution at near genocide level. That's on their particular um, website. And they're talking about the fact that the persecution has increased over the years. So this article points to a study which found that Christians were the most persecuted religious group. A lot of persons would have thought that it would have been another group, probably like, probably Jews. Yeah. But trust me, worldwide, Christians are the persons who are going through the most persecution. You go to places like India, you go to certain countries, you can't do some things. Amen. I remember when I was in, um, when I went to Kenya, 
amen, and we went to a place called um, Mombasa, amen, which is practically Muslim. We were right beside Somalia. And while we're preaching, praise God, I, I, I'm preaching and I'm saying, God, I, I need to cover me. I didn't come here to get blow up, amen. I want you to be with me because anything can happen. A few years back, amen, we, 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 we were, there, there was a great persecution in one of the malls in Kenya. If you can remember, some, some Muslims, some Somalia came over and there was a great shoot of a lot of people died. So therefore, when you go to the malls in Kenya, the, the, you know, like you go into an airport and you have a checkpoint, that's how the malls are. And I didn't know, so myself and a bishop uh, had our phone and we were taking picture. And when I see a police has come to us, uh, well, police soldier, kind of saw they look, and they said, walk with me. And, um, and, and we walk with them. Luckily, the pastor invited us I said they never know any man and mad wanted us to pay money and all this type of stuff but he was saying you're not supposed to take pictures so you can't even take i was in kenya i'm seeing that boy this is africa this don't look like africa to me this is like this look good this look better than mars i've seen in germany i want to take pictures amen but because of the constant persecution that is happening to kenya which is a christian country but it's muslim border country somalia amen they have to take these high risk and high security levels to protect the people but what we're seeing is an increase in persecution of Christians, amen. So the top 50 countries where it is hardest to be a Christian, you know what our countries are? You have countries like, uh, remember read what the article says, it says every day, eight Christians worldwide are killed because of their faith. Every week, 182 churches or Christian buildings are attacked. This is, a, this is up to January 15, 2020. This is a recent article and every month, 309 Christians are in prison unjustly. Praise God. So we talk about Christian persecution. It is hard to be a Christian in place like North Korea. Amen. It, it's hard to be a Christian in place like Afghanistan and Somalia. And these are the top 10. And Libya, Pakistan, and in um, Sudan, Yemen, Iran, India. These countries are the top 10 countries where the article, if you read through all of it, that has put that part, out, that part out, where it's hard to be a Christian. So guess what happened? Child of God. In the top 50 countries where Christians are the most persecuted for the faith, 260 million Christians suffer high to severe level of persecution. In other words, in these top 50, in, I only show you 10, but in the top 50, 260 million Christians suffer high to severe levels of persecution. Mean they might get them head cut off. Mean they might get shot in the head. Mean that 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 they have to be hiding underground. You see what we take for we take. We take some things for granted. I remember a sister having a sister from China trying to do a program for her, telling her how China is like and the church and whatever. And she had to do this in secret. She had to use code words to bring out her point because she's in China and her thing is being monitored. Amen. And guess what, brethren? Thank God that right now we are in a country where it is not so bad. Praise God. And it's not so terrible. And that is why God, I strongly believe that many of us are going to be beat with many stripes. Amen. Because we have this thing so free. While in some countries of the world, people have to be hiding and people have to be doing under places in 2021. Amen. And these people are serious about God. Amen. When I went to Tanzania, I saw Christians who now have half of the things that we have. Amen. And they are 50 times more serious than us. They waited for church to keep. A lot of us, we know church is supposed to finish by nine o'clock. And by nine o'clock, I'm out. Amen. And these people waited for us to come. And we never reached. Our, we're going to about three different churches. And we never reached the third church at about 12 o'clock midnight. And the church was still packed because they wanted us to come with the word of God. When we gave them a Bible, one person in the church have a Bible. One, amen, the pastor, because they can't afford a Bible in Tanzania. And we went and we brought Bibles for them. And it was like we're giving the people gold. But yet still we have Bible and we keep it on our shelves and we don't read it. But these people, and trust me, brethren, we have to realize what we have and make the best of it because we are in the last days. And it's important that we make it. Then there's defection from the faith. Amen. There are people now who are shifting from Christianity to other things, amen. And nowadays, what? and if you're even a part of Christianity, you're going to what is called more like a Christian science, Christian uh, new age type of thing, amen. And even the thinking, and many sermons I hear and many things people say, and they don't even realize that it's Christian science in nature, but I won't go back to that, amen. So there's been a defection from the faith. Muslim project to be the fastest growing religious group. Can you believe that? So estimated percentage in population size 
from, from and this is from 2015 to 2016, you said that the Muslim will grow, outgrow the Christians. So if the church should remain, or if God should come back to by 2060, then the Muslim is going to outgrow the church. You see, we will only grow by 34, and Muslim will grow by 70. That's we ahead. That means that for every Christians, there's two Muslim, and it's a worldwide thing. Oh. Research center, and this is taken from the research center based demographics based on what they are seeing, the fastest growing religion worldwide. It, it means that we have work to do, brethren. Amen. Hallelujah. So presently, you have about 2.92 billion Christians. And you have about 2.76 billion Muslims. That's how close they are to us. And give time, it's going to stretch right across us based on how, how fast they are growing. The man is serious about what they're doing. The devil is serious about deceiving people. We need to be serious about this thing and serious about winning souls. Souls are dying and we need people to be saved. Amen. Now, this, these two graphs show a decline in the number of Christians in European countries. And I watched a video recently where many European countries today, amen, uh, are, are practically countries that were Christian countries. I know the young people are saying, boy, they have no religion. Is that they have no religion? They are just atheists or whatever the case is. And Christian, if you can remember uh, back in certain time, even though it was Catholic, um, majority, I mean, they still believe that there was a God. At least they believe that there was a God. Nowadays, in these countries, these European countries, these people don't even accept that there's a God. So there has been a great decline in the in the in 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 in, in, in terms of um, Christianity. So non-Christians now are on the increase. My God, and there's a defection from the faith. I'm going to look at that, but I, I want to leave that one to later on. Lawlessness has decreased, and, and, and there's a decrease in love. So the number of murders, we're looking at our little country, Jamaica, from the period 1980 to 2019. Amen. From 1980 to 1989, you have 4,870 murders. From 1990 to 1999, you have 7,621 murders. From 20 to 2009, 20, 2009, we have 13,000 murders. And from 2010 to 2019, you have 12,698 murders. I mean, this is right on border here. Amen. And, 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 and the statistics that I just bring it up to 2019, amen. But at the same time, probably if I bring it to 2021, it's as far out number. This probably if I brought it to 2020, you would have gone over this. But I was just working with the data that I have placed on a graph and we work it here. But it shows you that there has been a steady increase in lawlessness and in murder, amen. If you can look at what is happening, for example, in the world, we see this man here, these people rebelling against uh, the whole thing and not uh, uh, abiding by the, the, the law, say, well, stay home or whatever the case. And we see the police here wrestling with the man. We see this guy, you can remember this guy was on the news saying, nah, go in. And yeah, I'm not going inside, yeah, man. And then telling government and all kind of thing. And we know what happened there. We see recently there was a five-year-old that was kidnapped Amen. I thank God she was formed, but it shows you the heart of men because what they were, and the prison yesterday is a 13 year old, if I, if I can't get it clear in the news, that was practically um, kidnapped. Things are happening. There's lawless and then there's a decrease in love. And guess what happened? The technology is here to preach the gospel everywhere. We have the internet, we have the radio, we have television, you have newspaper, you have magazine. The technology is around for the gospel to be preached everywhere. I, I, I was quoting from, I think, in, in Revelation chapter 11 on Wednesday and doing a Bible study and was telling them that back in the day when they quoted about the two witnesses who died in the street for three and a half years, many people say it was foolishness, amen, because that can never happen. How can two men die in Jerusalem and the whole world see it? All right, I can tell you this right now. The whole world can see what is happening in Jerusalem right now. If you turn on your TV and you got on worldwide news, I got on news, you can see it. Amen. Back in the day, everybody wonder how it's going to be done. But today we see how it can be done. Amen. And we realize that the Bible got it right all the time. Amen. The Bible is always right. Amen. Let God be true and every man a liar. The word of God is never wrong. You might not understand it. It progressively reveals itself to you. Over time, you will get it. Amen. You might think it was this, 
but technology, we see where technology is going to play a big role in these things. No, I'm going to move on. I, I want to give a warning from the Holy Ghost tonight. And this is in relation to the church. The Apostle Paul sent a warning from the Holy Ghost to the church. He said, please know the following. The revelation that there will be a deception in the latter days. Come to Paul from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit warn us that in the latter days there's going to be a deception. So the Bible says in 1 Timothy 4.1, Now the Spirit speak expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. And what they will do? They will give heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Praise God. Now, what is the latter time? Based on 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1, we can say that before the Lord returns and also in successive season, some shall depart from the faith because of deception. Note we, when someone departs from the faith, they are abandoning the essential teachings of the church. And we are seeing that so clearly in today's time, it is blowing your mind. Amen. I'm presently I'm doing a study from a brother, amen, who did a Bible study, who is teaching something that is completely off, amen. And, and some the person says, bring it to my attention. I say, oh, they, they, they start getting confused because they're not understanding. Why is it that we have been teaching this, amen? We have been teaching that people, in order for people to be saved, amen, they must repent of their sins. They must get baptized in Jesus' name. They must get the Holy Ghost. The apostles have preached this in the first century. In the second century, the apostles preached and says that existed. The church has been preaching this for ever since. How nowadays we don't need to do this, amen. When the scriptures teach that he that believes and baptized shall be saved, amen. How is it that all you need to do now is believe and you're saved? Where does that come from in scripture? Nowhere. Abraham believed God. How did he believe God? He left the land of the Chaldeans. There it was accompanied with work. Ah, let me not get here because I, I, I feel that. Huh? Holy Ghost. I feel that. So yes. here we are seeing where people are departing from truth. Amen. So look at this. Some will depart from the faith. So there's an article in June 1997, article in the US News and World Report describes a Virginia pastor who said, and I quote, would rather, he said he would rather preach on Bos Bosnia justice or world peace than on Bible stories or personal salvation. And this was a pastor who said this. Now, this is an example of a man who has departed from the faith and followed his own direction. Because how can you say you would prefer to preach on Bosnia justice and world peace and whatever instead of preaching Bible stories? What you're saying in the stories of the Bible, they don't have much meaning. But all scripture, the Bible says, is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction and instruction in righteousness. If you read about Moses, it can help you. If you read about Paul, it can help you. If it's a story, it can help you. If it's just a line, it can help you. All scripture, but the word of God is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than I will rather to preach this gospel message because I am not ashamed of it. It is the power of God and to salvation. Praise God. Yes. But we are realizing that some have departed from the faith. Amen. And when we talk about the faith, the faith is the content of what Christians should believe. There are some things in scriptures that we should believe. There are some things that we should hold on to and we should not let go. I mean, I, I like Sir Willie's teaching where it says, earnestly contend for the faith. We need to hold on to something. So we talk about the faith here. We're not talking about uh, if you believe or not in terms of faith as in Hebrew 11, 1. Amen. We're talking about faith in the sense of what we should the word of God teaches us to do. Amen. The, 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 the lessons, the things that the pastors left for us to adhere to. Amen. The faith describes the essential teachings of the Christian faith. It is still the Christian faith for you to live holy. It is still the Christian faith for you to walk righteous. It is still the Christian faith. Amen. For us to pray, for us to fast, for us to read the word. It's still the Christian faith that if you stop to do these things, you're living a life of sin. Praise God. Because if you don't eat every day, you're going marga down in a similar way. If you don't eat in the spirit, you're going to marga down too. And therefore, there's many people coming to church fat like, like Umpty Dumpty, but marga like a skeleton. If you look at them in the spirit, if God should put on our spiritual eyes and we look, I would say, boy, that sister, they look good, man, and look pretty. But when we really look at it, we're seeing bones. We're seeing people who are nothing, who are purely pulling themselves to church because they have removed themselves from the faith. Praise God. So the Bible said the word deception, as the scripture talk about, is comes uh, from a Greek word. Planio, and it occurs 30 times or 39 times and 37 verses. And it actually means to cause to stray, to lead astray, to lead inside from the right way. 
to fall away from the truth. Amen. And we are seeing, we give some examples of where the Bible speaks about this. Jesus, for example, said, and Jesus answered and said unto them, take heed that no man deceive you. I started there because that was the verse we read. But from the outset, Jesus warned the disciples that many would be deceived as they anticipate his return. So as we anticipate the coming of Christ, many people who are coming to church are going to be deceived. I am not surprised by what I'm seeing. I'm not surprised that the apostolic church don't look like the apostolic church anymore. I'm not surprised that people are saying, well, nothing no wrong with that. Amen. And it's okay. Amen. And what prostitutes used to wear in 1980s is what the saints wear in it today because we have become so desensitized that we don't even realize that that's how the devil operates over time. So what people used to wear in 1980 and would be considered a prostitute, the people who went to church today and said, no, it's normal clothes. Amen. But if somebody from the 1980s should come and look at that person, amen, they would say, well, prostitutes don't go to church. But guess what? We have become desensitized over time that we don't even realize that that's how the devil operates. So Paul said, be not deceived. Evil communication, do what? Corrupt good manners. Amen. We have been so exposed to things that are not of church. Amen. Amen. We have become so exposed to nice preaching. Amen. And we think that, amen, we don't preach the gospel anymore. No. We preach motivational speeches. Amen. And therefore, we get people hyped up. Amen. But evil communication corrupts good manners. Part of being able to see God is not mocked for whatever man soweth, that shall he also reap. Paul or James said, Do not hear my beloved version. Don't be deceived. Amen. So we are seeing over and over. This is just for examples where people in scripture is telling us that there's going to come, warning us about the whole issue of deception. This is last day things, and this is what is happening in the body of Christ in the church today. But brethren, amen. God would not have us to be in darkness. He will not do things. He will not come unless he warns the church first. He stands at the door and knock as he did with the church of Laodice and says, any man, hear my voice. So 1 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, the source of deception was also made clear from the verse. Deceiving spirits. Some of these doctrines, they tell you where it's coming from. Demonic spirits who seek to deceive men and women and to entice them away from the truth. And doctrine of devils, the specific teaching of these demonic spirits. Amen. So there are some spirits that have come. Amen. And they are uh, pulling people from the truth. We are accepting too many things, brethren. We are pulling. I Give me that whole time. I'd rather be an old time Christian than anything I know. There's nothing like an old time Christian. And I want to, I want, when, I want to ensure that when the Apostle Paul come in, you come in and say, no. But guess what happened? I strongly believe that some of these apostles come and see what we call church today. They're like, all right, because we have so diverted and we are thinking that this is church, amen. But God is bringing us back to some roots. Why do you think we're doing so many teaching in this time, amen? Because sometimes we have become so hyped up on preaching and nothing is wrong with preaching. Don't get me wrong. I love preaching. The preaching of the gospel must be done. But there have to be some little finger getting deep in your ears with the true word of God so the people can be stable in this season. The source of deception is important because it confirms Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. It says, but we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Amen. So all we're seeing happening is thus the devil intensifying what he has done. Amen. And people are being pulled out. So we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. It's against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. We're living a season of deception. Amen. The Holy Spirit had accurately stated that there would be a succeeding season of deceit. And in one season in the 19th century, we see all kinds of things popping up. For example, in the 19th 1830s, we have, for example, the Mormonism coming up under Joseph Smith. Then we have the Millerite movement in the 1840s. We know the Millerite movement clearly. This is where the Jehovah Witnesses come from, and the Adventists came out of. As a matter of fact, the Adventists came directly out of the Millerite movement under Ellen G. White. I mean, ourselves and um, James White and Joseph Bates and these guys who are Adventist, um, we call it now, forerunners amen and they came out of the millerite movements after what is called the great disappointment because they anticipated and they calculated that god was going to come back a particular time and william miller after christ in the comeback and it was a great disappointment he himself said he made an error but ellen g white said no man you can't be wrong so she said look here and that's why they came up with what is called the sanctuary doctrine so you're saying that god moved from one part of the sanctuary to another part of the sanctuary and the cleansing of the temple i, I can't tell you that bent his theology inside out amen but at the end of the day, it shows you how deception came into place. That you have the Jehovah Witness now, who was a similar, they have similar teaching to the Adventists. They both believe that Jesus is Michael, the archangel. They both believe in 
couple of similar things. The difference though is that Charles T. S. Russell, amen, had a little difference. Miller um, Ellen G was convinced of the Sabbath, amen, and certain dietary teaching by a seven-day Baptist, which was before the seven-day Adventist, amen. And that is why, along with the Millerites teaching, they also adapted the seven-day teaching, amen, and they formed what is called the seven-day Adventist church. But you had the Jehovah's Witness was there. They had the Christian scientists under Mary Baker Eddy, amen, a woman tell you that, look here, man, there's no such thing as sin. There's no such thing as pain. There's no such, all of these things are things in the mind. Amen. And she go on and she go on and, you know, this is not going to happen. And you can, lies, devils. So we are seeing a season of deception. And this chart does tell you what comes out of what. So the Millerite movement, you have the Seventh-day Adventist. Then from the Seventh-day Adventist, you have the Kramer Seventh-day Adventist Church of God. You have the Hemis first. So it just gives you a breakdown in essence of what, who came out of what. A season of deception. Then in the 1950s and 60s, the Holy Ghost and Akron stated that there would be a successive seasons of deception. So you have what, praise God, the unification movement and the Song Ming Yun in 1954. You have the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in 1966. You have Scientology, which happened in 1953. So all that Paul was talking about, we see it. This is a perfect example of what Paul spoke to Timothy about as he painted Timothy from prison. He says, evil men and seducers shall work worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So they themselves are deceiving others, and yet still because they are men, they are also being deceived. Because some of these men are convinced that what they're teaching is some form of truth. Amen. It, it reminds me of, um, I think, Anton LaVey. Who, was the, who started the, the, the satanic church. And he was convinced, he thought that hell, he thought that hell was a party place. I mean, that's what the devil tricked him. He thought that hell would have been good. And when he was about to die, amen, he sat on his deathbed. And what they normally did, they, they would transform or pass on their leadership from one to the other. And he lied on his deathbed, was about to die. And when he saw where he was going, Amen. When he realized that this was no party, this was not, he started to ball out. It, it is a known fact. The man started to ball. Anton LaVey, the man who started the, 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 the Satanic Church, started to ball out. Amen. But, and, and, and some of the persons who were around it, few of the persons who were around him, some of them left it because they couldn't understand this is their leader, this strong man who has been doing all of these things. But yet still, when his death bell, when the devil really show the true side of the kind, amen. When the devil really show you, you know, that's why, brethren, Live holy, walk holy. All the pleasure that you feel in this time and this life is only for a season. Amen. But what will happen? The true side of the coin is only shown when it's too late. And when it's too late and the devil says, boy, come home, come home. Amen. You're like, God, I don't want to go there. Amen. But it's going to be too late. So the Bible says, how can we be seen? It says, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Talking about the... Uh, the, 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 the back of Armageddon, even him who is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness and unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. How are you deceived? You receive not the love of the truth that you may be saved. How are you deceived? You receive not the love of the truth, the word of God. It's when they start saying, boy, we love praise and worship, but we can't take the Bible study too long. We can't take the word, man. We don't read my Bible, no, man, too much. Mm -mm, we can't bother with that. How are they saved? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. So according to the dictionary, truth is, the, which, which truth is that which is in accordance with fact or reality. The reality of the child of God is his word, is the word, is his, and I say his, I put his with a capital H which means it is God's word. What is true for us? It is the word of God. So the Bible says in St. John 17, 17, sanctify them to thy truth. Thy word is truth. And there's some truth about truth. Let me tell you something about truth. Truth is absolute. Amen. But our grasp of it is not. Mm. All right. As finite creatures, we grow in our understanding of truth. But truth is absolute. Meaning, a couple of years back, they used to say, the world is flat. Over time, we realize based on technology and based on the world, mark you, God had it right all the time. As I say, it seems that it's on the circle of the earth. We know the scripture is careful that the Bible already, there's no error in scripture. Amen. But, but society dictated that the earth was flat. Amen. But our knowledge of it was not. 
In other words, most of people in society held on to a flat earth theory. Amen. But does that make the flat earth theory true? No. It was never true from beginning. Truth is absolute. Truth is undeniable, real, objective, and knowable. You can know truth. Truth is not subjective to what I think. It is therefore I cannot invent the truth because I run the risk that my invention is false, which is the opposite of truth, making my invention not true at all. Let me say that again. Truth is not subjective to what I think it is. Therefore, I cannot invent the truth. Amen. I can't say, boy, because I think that, you know, you know, Ella Willis, many of people said people have to baptize in Jesus' name again, you know. You know, that, let, let that be the truth now. Go ahead and start preach that. All right. Not because I said that makes it truth. I cannot invent the truth because I run the risk that my invention is false. Because if you don't baptize in Jesus' name, you're not saved, which makes my invention false, which is the opposite of what was truth. Therefore, my invention is not true at all. So I can invent truth. Truth is not subjective to what I think. Truth is absolute. It is undeniable, real. It's objective and it is noble. And the devil uses the same old strategy that was used in the garden and many are deceived by it today. It says, and the serpent said unto the woman, and this is very important. I want us to take this too because as children of God, and the serpent said to the woman, he shall not surely die. For God must know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. Amen. The deception in this season is so subtle, child of God, that if we do not put on the whole arm of God, and that's what the saint prayed about, put on the whole arm of God. I heard the prayer. Amen. If we don't put on the whole arm of God, we too will be, will be deceived. Now, the deception in this season comes out of the ancient teaching found in religious like Hinduism and Taoism and Buddhism. You see, there's nothing new under the sun. There are some, there are some new things that the devil is pushing in and we are, we, 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 we are accepting it and we don't even realize. It is packaging things that we call self-helps and self-reliance and self-esteem. And I notice I highlight the word self because that's where the devil has always operated in the realm of self. So the Bible teaches us that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. But philosophy today teaches that I can do all things if I believe it. No, sounds similar, but they're not the same. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. In other words, and you can only do things through Christ. Amen. If Christ is involved, then it can be done. And if Christ allows it to be done, then it can be done. You can only do things through Christ. Very important. But that's not what the self-help teach today. It says, I can do all things if I believe it. So if I put my mind to it, it can be done. Self-help, self-esteem, self, 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 self. Remember the devil, I will, and I will, and I will. So without even realizing we have removed the control and the destiny of our lives out of the hand of God into our own hands. So look at this woman now. You know, so a couple of things that have been coming to the world, she's doing a selfie. You are the best thing that ever happened to you. Learn to love yourself is the greatest love of all. <laughs> Contradiction to scripture. Greater love at no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for himself. Word of wisdom, love yourselves more than you love others. Somebody put that on their status and I took it down. And I called the person and said, that's not a word of wisdom. That's a deception of the devil. Learn mm -hmm. to love yourselves more than you love others. That's not what the Bible teach. The Bible says, you must love your brother as you love yourself. That's not a scripture teach. Sir Willie, say you're my teacher here. Amen. <laughs> not a scripture teach. That's what I remember. That's what I read. But we have seen where it is flipped. Deception in this season. The apostle Paul, while in prison, saw the evil of the day. He said, This know also as in the last days, perilous time shall come and go on. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. So can I tell you something? Everything that he pointed in the rest of the list filtered from this. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, poor, blasphemers, disobedient to peers, unthankful and holy, without natural affection, true spirits, false accusers, incontinent fears, despised of foot that are good, heady, traitors, high minded, lovers of all of these things that he pointed to filters from the fact that men have become lovers of them own self. Why are you heady? Self. Everything that goes in that list in, in Second Timothy goes to the fact. And the devil knows this. So he wants us to think about me. It's all about me. Let me know three points about self-love. 
Love of self is the basic sin from what all other sins flow. <laughs> when we make ourselves do all will the center of life, divine and human relationship are destroyed. In other words, if it's all about you, eventually you're not gonna love people, you're not gonna treat people as they should. When we make our own will the center of life, obedience to God and charity to men both become impossible because it's all about me. Self, you become selfish. That's what right. are the other deceptions in this season? The term used and promoted by the new age religion every day is called Christ consciousness. And you probably have heard it now. You need to become Christ conscious. Amen. But you see, sometimes we don't, you have to, but this is where study comes in because you want to ensure that you're not just taking on things. This terminology, Christ consciousness, is not Christian in root. It comes out of the new age religion. And what does it say? This is the belief that Jesus was able to do all his miracles and live a successful life because he was able to attain to the top of his consciousness. So in a similar way, in order for you to be successful, you must reach the highest level of your consciousness. So let me say you must attain a level of self, of, of Christ consciousness. They're not saying that you must be like Christ. They're saying that you yourself can meditate to the point and reach a point to the top level of your consciousness where you're able to perform miracles and levity because you, and this comes out of you know, Hinduism and Taoism and Buddhism and all these isms that are in the world over there. But guess what, brethren? There's something that we can do. What must we do in order to deal with these things? Number one, we must know your enemy. Know who your enemy is. Understand that we are in the last days. This is the last days, but you must understand that there's an enemy at work. And every child of God, I want you to be saved. And you must what? Use the whole armor of God. Now, Satan is compared to a snake or a serpent in the natural world. And we know that from Revelation chapter 3, verse 1, Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Revelation chapter 3, 12, verse 9, the Bible calls him a serpent. And we know that scripture. So consider the spiritual application of the following natural principles. Now, it said the venom of a poisonous snake, it falls into three categories. You have what is called the new, new, um, newer taurines, and this affects the nerves. You have what we call the hemotaurins, it affects the blood. You have the cardiotaurins, which affects the heart. So when a snake bites you, it poisons you in one of these three ways. It either affects your nerves, it either affects your blood, or it affects your heart. Can I tell you something? When we Satan affects us and the devil, who is that nasty serpent, that wicked devil, comes in, he attacks the three places too. Because when he attacks your nerves, he attacks your courage. Amen. He wants to, you to fear him. Amen. But the Bible says in Joshua chapter 1, verse 7, only be those strong and very courageous. Uh, praise God. That's what the scripture teaches. It says that thou mayest observe to do all according to all the law that's written by Moses' servant. It says, look here. But the first part says, only be those strong and very courageous. Amen. That's what God wants from us. It affects our hearts in the sense that it affects our worship and our service to God. Amen. You must realize that when the devil starts poisoning you with some things, your focus has shifted. No longer is, is that case where these people join. The Bible says in Matthew 15, 8, these people join to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. So what we are having now is a lot of praise and worship in church that seem hype and hey, but truth and when they check their hearts, it is really poisoned. It's so, the music is so nice, you know, and it gives their hype, but it has no change in capacity because it has no change in ability because you are being poisoned. It affects your blood. The devil tries to prevent the work of the blood of Jesus Christ, the salvation, the healing, the deliverance that comes from the blood in our lives. Amen. But we can deal with the serpent. We know how to deal with the serpent. Now, there's another thing that we must realize how the devil operates because he's called a serpent. He protects himself by doing a couple of things. He disguises himself. In other words, we said in his last days, he comes as a disguise. The rattlesnake, for example, some snakes are very hard to see because they look like the dirt and the trees in which they are found. So the Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 14, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed in an angel of light. In other words, a lot of things that we are seeing on TV look good. Amen. It looks like a tree. It looks like the real thing. But marvel not. Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Amen. I tell you now, don't run for everything. Don't everything will look good is not good. Some of us say, but we're past and not do it. Like, but pastor not sound like T.D. Drake. Ready, 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 ready. Amen. But at the end of the day, the man might be preaching the word of God. One might be preaching motivational speech and one is giving you the word that will keep you in the season. But guess what? We'll, we, we don't realize the disguise of the devil in this season. Talking about the church. Secondly, there is an imitation. Praise God. And, and some still protect themselves by imitating. One example is the African 
see viper which freezes itself and sticks itself his neck out like a twig in other words it's on the tree and if you see it it looks so much like a tree you would never tell but the bible says beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep clothing but in while they're raving wolves so a lot of people nowadays they sound like prophets they preach like prophets they, they they have the walk they have the talk they have the look amen but there's something in my spirit that says something is wrong amen even in the church setting amen you have to be careful who you invite on your podium you have to be careful who you declare to preach the word of god to you because there are many false prophets in this season that look like sheep but they are really wolves amen, amen. snake protects themselves by increasing in size, the puff adder protects itself by blowing itself as big as possible. So the devil sometimes makes it make the situation looks bigger than it is. You know what I think that frustrates me when people full with the Holy Ghost said, Deacon, come on my house, Ella, come on my house, come pray because my house full of demon. And 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 and, and we say you have Holy Ghost. <laughs> me no, me no, me no, me no. Me and me. Anyway, so. I strongly believe if you are live for God, the devil can't walk in your house. Forgive me. It's, it's just me. It's just me. I don't know. I understand if you're a new convert and then just learn something. But you can't in a search for 20 years and I go up and pour him and I preach about um, 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 God the Father, God the Son. Come on, saints, man. That means you're in the book, man. You're not in the book. Come on. But we need to be realize that Jesus is bigger than every other situation. So guess what? I, I, I will go and pray now, but it always goes in the back of my mind that, boy, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. You can't be a saint. I understand if you if come to pray for an unsafe person house and they have demon problem in them house. Yeah, they have Holy Ghost, but you can't have Holy Ghost and attempt to come pray with Holy Ghost. So what, what you have? A different Holy Ghost me have than you have. Me get a different dimension of feeling. Amen. And you. Anyway, they are frightening sounds. Snakes make hiss or rattle, making frightening sounds to steer you away. So there are some people who are frightened, amen, by what they are seeing. COVID-19 have frightened them. They're afraid. <laughs> because I said, Jesus, what is happening? Oh, the mark of the beast. Oh, my God. My God. What is happening? When we should be rejoicing because these things are telling me that Jesus is coming soon. Yes. night or noon. Amen. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All of the saints shall rise. My God. Why am I frightened this time? Because I see what's happening in the American economy. Some should be some to be stirring my belly, saying, Boy, Jesus, Jesus, come, come, Lord Jesus, come. But you know what happened? We're not living as we should. So states attacked in four different ways. They strike you, they constrict you, they terrorize you. And 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 and, and, and I can't go through this, but I want to borrow one of them. They wrap around you and squeeze you to death. Let me borrow that one for the sake of time. There was a there's a story I heard, and Pastor Guiz usually tell us the story about a person who bought a snake uh, as a pet. And what they happen, they have the snake there and call it my little pet, my little pet snake. And the snake keep on growing and every day they play with the snake and they play with the snake, but they don't play with snake brethren. So guess what happened now? The snake get bigger and bigger and they keep on wrapping themselves and every day they're having fun with this nice snake till one day, the nice little pet turned big and it wrapped itself around the person and it squeezed the person to death. That's how sin operates. That's what the devil does. There are some things that you're doing and you probably think it's okay. Amen. It's, 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 it's nice and it's honest now. It's nice and it's small and it's not so bad. But keep on feeding it, man. It's going to get bigger, man. Keep on feeding it. going to keep on playing with it. You're going to wrap itself up until one day when it wraps itself. It's so tight that you can't let it go. Snake locate their prey by picking up dust on their tongue, which relays information to their brain. But guess what? If you stand still, a snake cannot locate it. You know that? So if you're actually in our place and there's a snake and you stand still, the snake can't find. Just stand up one place. And this is, this is a known fact. Amen? So don't panic and run in confusion and fear because stand against Satan fearlessly. Stand. The Bible says in Exodus chapter uh, 13, 14 and verse 3, and Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Don't bother worry. But we one of them, I run up and down on the table, vaccinated and vaccinated. Uh, you don't need the time for them. So they stand still and watch God work. Now therefore stand and see this great thing which the Lord will do before your eyes. I can to 1 Samuel chapter 12, verse 16. Amen. Now how do we avoid, praise God, snake bite? Recognize poison snake. First of all, you have to know your enemy. You have to wear protective clothing. You have to avoid knowing snake territory. You have a friend with you. Avoid walking after dark in dark areas and do not go out. And these are natural things, but all of these things can be borrowed. In other words, recognize poisonous snakes. You have to know what the poisonous snakes are. You have to wear protective clothing. In other words, clothe yourself, arm yourself in the things of God. Amen. Put on the whole armor. Avoid known snake territory. If God never said it, they don't go there. 
Amen. Don't matter feel say you, all right, I, I am so strong that I'm going to go into the prostitute's house. Amen. I'm so strong, hallelujah, that I'm going to go and I'm going to witness to these people in this way. Kind of cut up the go-go house. Amen. Because guess what? Me make out a cardboard. I can lie down with the sister because me make out a cardboard and nothing is going to happen. Avoid known state territories. Have a friend with you, brethren. In other words, Jesus have a principle. He's sending the disciples two by two. And there's a reason for that. Amen. Sometimes you have to have your brothers back. You know, one of the reasons why, um, 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 uh, what's what the name of the guy? David kill, um, what was the name of the guy? Uriah's husband, Uriah. So David kill Uriah. Because he gave a command. He, said, he never just tell him, say, put by the front of the battle, you know. But he said, when the enemies come back, withdraw yourself from him. Look back at the scripture again. Amen. That's the principle. In other words, don't ever think that you're an island. You can't make this thing by yourself. Sometimes, every, so, and Minister Willis knows, sometimes we call him, because all the time he's strong. Amen. But sometimes we call him and say, brother, I go through this, and I'm feeling this particular way. And he said, boy, we need to pray about this. You understand? Or I'm feeling this way. I'm a, there are times we get up and I'm pray for the pray for Minister Wilson. We know he's been praying for me. We don't talk every day, but I know he's praying. We have a friend with you because guess what? We're dealing with a devil. Amen. And guess what? I need to have your back and you need to have my back. That's the church. Amen. Amen. The first, the first that is done, and I'm, so, I'm, I'm wrapping up. The first that is done in the natural world is to make a cut in the shape. So what happens if somebody's bitten by a snake? If somebody a snake bites you, somebody's there and they're under, their heart is affected, their nerve is affected. It is said that if you make a cut in the shape of a cross over each bite mark and then suck out the poison, it can help the person. And this method illustrates the work of the cross. It's only the cross that is going to free us from the poison of sin. My God. Amen. So the Bible says, wherefore, take unto you the whole arm of God that he may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And look at the scripture. Stand therefore having your loins girded about with truth. Notice he started with truth. He started with what? Truth. You know what you need to start with? Truth. What we start with? Truth. What is truth? Sanctify them to that truth. That word is truth. Where do we start? With truth. And having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So Paul used figurative language and each, of the, each part of the armor is symbol of something real. To understand what each means, we must look beyond the symbol to reality. The armor is symbolic description of the Lord himself. We can go into that. Know the order in which the armor is given us is also very important. I mean, I made mention of this because this is something that I could go into Amen. And why we need to use the armor because the armor is not just something that is there. It's figurative, the symbolic description of you putting on Christ. Put on Christ. Amen. That's what he's saying. Amen. And even though he was using the Roman soldier and what they wore and how they wore their armor, at the end of the day, it's really symbolic of us putting on Christ because truth be told, it's only Christ that can protect us against any devil. You can protect yourself against the devil. Holy Christ can. So it's very important that we understand that the order is very important in, in the terms, in the relation to how he gave us the armor. He said, first of all, put on the truth. Truth. Truth protects against deception. It's only the truth of the word of God that will protect you against deception. The breastplate is righteous, it protects against unrighteousness. The shoes protect against confusion. And I want you to understand deception, unrighteousness, confusion. The shield, which is faith, protects us against unbelief. The helmet protects us against from bondage and the sword of the spirit, which is this, the word of God. But look at it now, the downwall progression of one that is not protected by the armor of God. This is what happened. Deception leads to unrighteousness. And righteousness leads to confusion. And confusion leads to unbelief. And unbelief leads to spiritual bondage. You see the difference? In other words, the order in which you put on these things is the order which you're going to protect. The belt is truth. The breastplate is righteousness. The peace, the shoes is peace. Amen. The shield is faith. The helmet is salvation. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Which is, so he started with the word and he ended with the word. But when we have removed ourselves from the word, there's a downward spiral. First one, there's deception, which leads to unrighteousness, which is practically sin. And the sin leads to confusion and confusion leads to unbelief and unbelief leads to spiritual bondage. So I close with this. Beloved, when I give all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered. I can tell you something based on everything that we spoke about earlier. Amen. We spoke about earthquake and famine and all of these things coming on. Not some time I spent on deception because this is 
where I know there are going to be more stains on this than anything else. And child of God, in this season, now is the time to be in the word. Now is the time to be more so in the word than ever. Amen. Because guess what? The end of all things is at hand. Get ready. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Mighty God of heaven, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you. The end of all things is at hand. What a word to our hearts tonight. We certainly honor the Lord for his words. And we have been taught tonight. We have learned and words of the Lord have been confirmed in our spirits. And certainly the Lord has been speaking to us and just encouraging us. It is the last oh, days. Oh, oh. And certainly the spirit of deception is at work. But once we have the truth of God's word, we can counter the lies of the adversary. We must earnestly contend. We must live holy. We've got to make it in. Praise the name of the Lord. We thank God for Deacon Elder Andrew Martin. We're certainly glad that he has taken the time to avail himself to share with us tonight. And my God, indeed, our hearts have been richly blessed. May we take these words. And with technology, we can always go back online and play it again and listen to it again. Because there's a, there's a, there's a whole lot that has been said tonight. I know he has been... Um, trying to pack a lot of stuff in the few minutes that we've got. But certainly, we can go back and take our time and muse upon it. Let us be doers of the word. Take it. Be like the Bereans. Read it again and see what the Lord is saying to our hearts. God bless you, my brother. God bless you richly in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're getting ready to close. We have a few prayer requests. We're going to take the prayer requests. We're going to pray for them. We're going to close out this segment of the service. And just in case there are persons who might have questions for our teacher tonight, we will take those afterwards in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so we have a salvation, healing, and covering a long list tonight. But I'm so glad we have a God who hears and answers prayer. And to want to hold these before the Lord. We want to pray much for each other, standing in the gap in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I want to invite Evangelist Oliphant to come and to pray for those who are in need of salvation. Esther, Cecil, and Andrew, who is in Andrew, that's Hudson, who is in need of salvation. And then we have those in need of healing. Um, I see Sister Lydia online. I want to ask her to pray for those who are in need of healing. And then I'll pray for those in need of covering and deliverance. So that's Evangelist Oliphant to pray for those in need of salvation, followed by Sister Lydia for those in need of healing. And then I'll cover those in need of covering and deliverance. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Father, how great are you, Lord. You are mighty and strong. Hallelujah. You are sovereign. Lord, you are the only wise God. Hallelujah. Father, the one who is touched with the feelings and our infirmities. Lord God Almighty Jesus, the one alone whose blood was shed upon that cross, hallelujah. Father, you bore our pain, hallelujah. Great God Almighty Jesus, hallelujah. You died for this cause, great God, hallelujah, Jesus. That, Lord God, we don't have to carry our burdens. We don't have to carry our pain. Oh, great God, but we can cast them upon you because you care. Eternal God and Father, your word declares that 
that healing, Lord God, is the children's bread. Lord God, your word, oh God Almighty, declare that if we believe, Lord Jesus, hallelujah, we shall receive. Lord God Almighty, Jesus, it is your will, hallelujah, that we prosper and be in good health. And so tonight, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, Lord God, we pray, great God, that your stripes that heal. Oh, great God Almighty Jesus, hallelujah, God Almighty, will be released, Lord God. Hallelujah, upon each and every person tonight uh, that is in need of your healing, Jesus. Uh, Lord God, we pray, Father, Lord God Almighty, hallelujah, Jesus. Uh, Lord God Almighty, that every wound, Lord Jesus, uh, hallelujah, God, you said that you will bound up, oh God, our wound. We pray, Jesus, that wherever there is pain, Lord God Almighty, Jesus, that your power, oh God Almighty, Jesus, to release, oh God Almighty, will bring release relief and release oh god almighty jesus over those that are in pain oh great god every sickness and disease lord jesus you have power and control over and so tonight jesus we ask great god that every sickness and disease in the body of your people will flee lord jesus every sickness and disease oh great god in the body oh god almighty jesus of those that are in need of healing tonight, great God. There will be, 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 oh God Almighty, cast out uh, in the name of Jesus, great God. Father, Lord God Almighty, Jesus, we're depending upon you. Uh, Father, where the doctors are unable to help. Uh, oh, great God Almighty, Jesus. Uh, oh God, where we don't know what to do. Uh, Lord God, we run to you, Lord Jesus. Uh, hallelujah, God Almighty, for the healing that comes only from you. We bow at your feet. Uh, oh, great Great God, and we declare that you are God, hallelujah, and you are sovereign, and you are holy, and you are master. So tonight, Jesus, we worship you, God, hallelujah, Jesus, because you are, you are, oh God Almighty, where our help comes from, the hill that we can look to. Oh, great God, when we are all alone, Jesus, we can call upon you, God, in the midst of a shutdown. Oh, great God. God Almighty, Jesus, we are, oh God Almighty, there is not as much access, God Almighty, oh God, to natural resources, great God, we can call upon you for your supernatural power and your supernatural resource, and know that you are there, Jesus, you're just a call away, God Almighty, so Jesus, wherever there is pain, Oh God, wherever there is sickness, oh great God, wherever there is depression, oh great God, wherever there, oh God, is a spirit of confusion, oh great God, sometimes God Almighty, it's not that our bodies are sick, but our bodies are oppressed, oh God Almighty Jesus, so we speak, we pray for spiritual healing, oh great God, in the body of Christ tonight, we pray Pray God that Lord Jesus, the spirit of confusion will be broken, the spirit of oppression. Oh God, the spirit of anxiety, God, that cause our hearts to feel as though it's failing Jesus. Great God, tonight, God, we pray for that peace and that calm that heals God Almighty. Oh Jesus, in a time like this where oh God stresses the order. So she says, I'm really about disconnected. All right, Sister Lydia seems to have been disconnected. Um, Sister Oliphant, please go ahead. Hallelujah. 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 Holy Lord. God. 
we worship you. Lord, we give you praise. Father, we thank you. We honor your holy name. We lift you up, Jesus. Hallelujah. You're the great God. You're the mighty God. You're the everlasting Father. You're the Prince of Peace. You're God alone, holy God, and there's none beside you. We give you thanks, O oh God Almighty, for this day, for this moment. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus Christ, we thank you, God, for your word, holy God, tonight to our hearts. We thank you, God Almighty, for the vessel, God, you use, God, to minister unto our heart. Lord Jesus Christ, and as we prepare and as we focus our hearts and our mind, God, hallelujah, and look for your coming. Lord Jesus Christ, we are. Holy God, aware there, God Almighty, that there are those around us, God, that have not yet come to know you, who to know is life eternal. And so tonight, Jesus Christ, even now, oh God Almighty, these three names, God Almighty, that are on this, oh God Almighty, this platform tonight, in the name of Jesus, Esther Kennedy, Cecile Wright, and Andrew Hudson, mighty God, you know them by name, hallelujah. You know them by nature, you're acquainted with their ways. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, mighty God, hallelujah, God Almighty, Jesus, you shed your blood, you die, God Almighty, holy God Almighty, for their sins. Oh, God, my Savior, you pay the price. You have already paid it all, Jesus Christ. And so tonight, God, we pray, holy God Almighty, that wherever they are, holy God Almighty, in the name of Jesus Christ, mighty God, that you will, oh God, touch them in a positive way. Send a word into their spirit, God. Put somebody, God Almighty, in their, in their life, God. Somebody, God, that will impact them in a positive way. Let a word come, God Almighty, to them, Jesus. To unshackle them, oh God Almighty. Oh God, from the forces of darkness. Mighty God, in the name of Jesus Christ, we stand upon your word tonight, Lord. And we agree in the name of Jesus Christ. Oh God Almighty, that whatever we ask in your name, Jesus, you will do it. And so, God Almighty, as we come to you, Lord God Almighty, ah, oh God, we lift them up before you and we pray, Jesus Christ, holy God Almighty, that you speak to their heart, Lord. Rest them from the clutches of the enemy. Write their name, holy God, in the book of life. Save them, God Almighty, in the name of Jesus, holy ghost, Lord God, not only these names, Lord Jesus, but there are so many, our own families, oh God Almighty, our sons, our daughters, oh God, our neighbors, oh God Almighty, in our communities, in the name of Jesus, our co-workers, oh God Almighty, our friends, oh God, we pray tonight, Jesus Christ, holy God, for mothers, even on this platform right now, with children, God Almighty, that grew up in the church, but today, God, they are not, holy God Almighty, but I pray, God, as you hear the heart of your people, as they cry before you day in, day out, Lord God, for the salvation of their children. Sometimes we feel hopeless, God. Hallelujah. Because the more we pray, sometimes it seems like they're going down destruction road and they're getting worse. So God Almighty, instead of getting better. But God, we know, Lord Jesus, that the impossible, holy God, is possible to you tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we might see some situation and from where we stand, Lord God, it look, oh God Almighty, like it's an impossible task. But God, we know that you are in control. And so tonight we lift up our children. We lift up our own family members. We lift up, oh God, all those that are not saved. And we pray, God, and give us that passion. Hallelujah. And that love in our heart, God, to reach those that are lost. Lord, we thank you for our salvation and we thank you, God, for hearing and answering and we thank you, God Almighty, for those, God Almighty, that will come to know you who to know is life eternal. We bless your name tonight and we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory and we give you thanks for what you're doing, for what you're about to do, God. We say thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Holy Ghost, we honor your name, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, tonight. 
as we continue to lift up these names before you. We stand in agreement, Lord God, of the prayers that have been made before on behalf of salvation and healing. Hallelujah. We pray for divine covering even now. Oh God, my Savior, for your man servant who availed himself, we pray right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Be magnified in his life, oh God. Give your angels charge continually over him, his family, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Help him to continue to wield the sword of the Spirit in these last and closing days, oh God. And as a teacher, Lord, to communicate the word, to break it down to sizable bites, so that your children, Lord, can assimilate same and grow in your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Keep your hand upon your son for your glory, God. Undergird, strengthen, and fortify him in these last and closing days. God, my Savior, do immeasurably more than I can ask, think, or imagine in his life. Hallelujah. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we pray. Oh, God, also for those in need of covering and deliverance, Sophia Morris. Oh, God, you are the deliverer. We ask you to do what only you can do. Break the bondages of sin. Oh, God, loose, God, every chains of darkness. Cause the yoke to be destroyed. Hallelujah. Sister Janil has, is, it, is preparing to do her exam and need your guidance. Lord, I pray, God, I pray, God, that you'll help her to study the things that are necessary, God, that will, be, that will cause her to be a success in the name of Jesus Christ. Bring back to her memory. The things she has studied is when she looks at the question, Lord, grant her wisdom, God, and to answer appropriately. Oh, God, bring her out of that testimony that you were there every step of the way and you brought her through the Tilda Dixon, Ramonia Miller, and the Kalila Anderson, also in need of deliverance, Marlon Henry and Leonardo Amor, and the Heinz family, Natalie Lawrence, Roberta Johnson, and Winshea Barrett, missing 13-year-old, be found and safely returned home. God, we hold these before you. We hold these names before you. We pray for your divine intervention in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Hallelujah. Show yourself strong on behalf of your children. Cover under your precious blood. Deliver from bondages of sin. Break the back of the adversary and cause your children to go free. Hallelujah. That child, God, who have been abducted in St. Thomas, we pray. We pray as the family awaits the return. Two days now, Lord, but we hold faith in you and we look to you, Lord God. And we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth for safe return in the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Cancel the assignment of hell. Hallelujah. And let your name be glorified. Let your name be praised. God, we ask, Lord, we do for you to do, oh God, what only you can do. Show up mighty and strong, God, my Savior. Hallelujah. Breathe upon your children, God, tonight. Help us to take heed to your word, hallelujah, and to be ready for your return, because your return draweth nigh. We are closer than we've ever been before. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord, not to be deceived, not to defect from the doctrine, but to hold fast until our change comes. Abba, Koshama, hallelujah, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Hold us close, Lord God of heaven, and land us safely. Lord, you are able to keep us, hallelujah, from falling, hallelujah, and present us faultless, hallelujah, before the presence of your glory with exceeding joy. Do it again for us, God. Do it, God, my Savior, hallelujah. Have your way as we commit ourselves into your care. We commit this week, Lord God, into your hands. We walk by faith, depending upon you, looking to you, the author and the finish of our faith. Hallelujah. Do your good pleasure and let your kingdom come. These we ask of you. Oh, God, my Savior, do immeasurably more than we can ask, think, or even imagine for your name's sake and for your glory. We give you thanks, Lord. We give you thanks. We give you thanks. 
in Jesus Christ's matchless name. Praise the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you tonight. The numbers are on your screen. If you are in this room or you're watching um, further on in the future, please give us a call. Submit your name in the chat. With your information, we'll call you. If you are not able to call us for one reason or another, we stand ready to work with you. We'll counsel with you. We'll pray with you. We'll lead you according to the principles of God's word so that you too can be saved. It is the last days. The end of all things is at hand. It behoves the child of God to be ready, to be ready, to be ready. God bless you one and all in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Please do remember and join us as we um, continue during the course of this week, God's willing, on Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday at 7.30, we have our Bible study, our prayer meeting, and our youth meeting, respectively. Please join us as we worship the Lord, and should the Lord delay his return, and we're still here on the planet, then join us six, next Sunday morning as we um, enter into our Zoom room Sunday school meeting, where we continue to break the bread of life. All our main services are uploaded to our YouTube page. That is Bethel United Church, Apostolic Portmore. Bethel United Church, Apostolic Portmore. Please like, subscribe, and turn on notification. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you richly in the name of Jesus Christ. Praise God. Are there any questions for our teacher tonight? You heard the word, the end of all things. A lot of, a lot of things were said. Um, a lot of graphs represented the timelines, seeing the increase in the external signs as well as the internal signs that are telling us that we are living in the last days and um, it behoves us to be ready. But if anybody have any question, could you raise your hand, we'll identify you and the presenter is ready to answer your questions, please raise your hand. Please come on in and ask your questions in the name of the Lord Jesus. Everybody is good. Everybody is good. All right, while you're thinking about it, um, let me ask a question, <laughs> Brother Andrew. Um, we, you did make mention about the gospel of the kingdom. Um, tell us, um, for those, who are, those of us who are not so um, keen, is there a difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of Jesus Christ? If there is, what is the difference? And if there isn't, help us to understand the sameness. Amen. All right, so the gospel, the Bible make reference of the gospel of the kingdom. And the gospel of the kingdom is preached in the book of Revelation, which makes reference to Christ setting up his kingdom on earth. Amen. It is the, the message that is preached during the Great Tribulation about Christ coming to establish his earthly kingdom. If you can remember, based on the Davidic covenant, where it was said that Jesus will forever sit on the throne of our, there will be always a descendant on the throne of David. We know that person that is speaking to in a prophetic sense is the man Christ Jesus. So during the great tribulation, amen, the gospel of the kingdom is preached because at that time, the gospel of our salvation would have ended, amen. And what is being preached now is that the Lord is coming a man who is going to uh, rule this world uh, with an iron fist, according to Revelation chapter 12, amen. And he's talking about the fact that he will sit on the throne of David, according to Revelation chapter 19, I think, or chapter 20, somewhere there. I think it's 19. Amen. But practically, what is, is the gospel of the, the everlasting gospel speaks about the, the, the message. Um, sorry, the gospel of the kingdom, sorry, speaks about this message about Jesus himself sitting on the throne of David forever. The gospel of our salvation is the message that we preach now, which is repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, getting the Holy Ghost. The death, the burial, and the resurrection, according to 1 Corinthians 50, I think 1 to 4, it speaks about that this is the gospel that we preach now. When Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation. He's talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection. But the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew 24 is the gospel that Jesus himself, the good news, that is what gospel means, the good news that Jesus one day is going to sit on the throne of David in Jerusalem. Amen. And the whole world is going to know and worship him. I don't know if that's clear enough, sir. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's, Beautiful. It's, 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 it's difficult. It's difficult. It's difficult to um to answer question to, to answer the question to a teacher, but I get what you're saying. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, Praise the Lord, Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord. May I say you. something? Yes, yes, go ahead, Ziff. Yes, the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom also. If you notice, it said it is not for um the gospel we have now is for is is for salvation. The gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a witness. witness. As a witness. That's, that's important, that's powerful. That's right. That's right. Thank you very much for that, Evangelist Oliphant. Sister Marcia, come on in, on your mic. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Thank you. God bless you, sir. And um Elder, I need a little more clarification on the gospel of the kingdom because even in the Lord's prayer, when he said we are to pray and said, your king, let your kingdom come on this earth as it is in, in heaven. Bring more clarification because in, in what, what I'm trying to understand from what the scripture says, um, Sir Martin, mm -hmm. Jesus preached, even Paul, not just Jesus, Paul also preached the gospel of the kingdom of God. And if I'm to understand the kingdom of God based on the word of God, God himself is the king. He has come. That's what he taught here while he was here. And he also demonstrated how things are in his kingdom. So I am a little confused now if there is a difference between the gospel of salvation and the gospel of the kingdom of God. I still have a gray area. Could you clarify for me, please? All right, no problem. Um... All right, first of all, what makes the difference is, is this is where context comes in. Um, and it's very important that when we, we read scriptures, we read them within, a con within the context. Ma Matthew, Matthew 24 was speaking about what was going to happen during the Great Tribulation. And during the Great Tribulation, what has been preached in the Great Tribulation is the gospel of the kingdom. And what the gospel of the kingdom there in that context is the fact that Jesus is coming. The next big event on the calendar is Jesus is coming and he's coming to establish a kingdom on earth. Remember, he, he is going to devour uh, the Antichrist in the valley of the Armageddon, the valley of Megiddo. And then he's going to have the, the, the sheep and the goat judgment that we usher into what is called the millennium reign of Jesus Christ, where he sits on the throne of David. So the context of Matthew 24, where that particular scripture is being used, amen, is, is very important. And notice in that context, the Bible is talking about, and in this time, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached. Now, in Jesus' prayer, Jesus made no reference of the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus said, thy kingdom come, which is a different terminology. Again, he's talking about the fact that we, when we pray, amen, the rule of God, which is practically what he's saying about, must be, a, must be established, amen, first. Amen. I mean, God needs to take first priority when we pray. What he says is important, not necessarily our will. Amen. So it's, it's really, when we look at scriptures, it's very important that we don't just read it, but we read it within a context, unless we'll be confused with words. And we have to know what words and terminologies mean. For example, when the Bible says in, um, and it's and and pulling one so you can get what I'm saying. Um, when the Bible says, sanctify, well, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. For example, we know that the word word there is logos, amen. And that logos there speaks to a thought or a plan. But there's another word, but there's another time when the Bible says, the word is nigh thee in thy mouth. Now in the English in the English Bible, we both see the same word, word, but the two word, there is two different meanings for word. One word is logos, which means a thought or plan. The other word is rima, which speaks to a spoken word. So therefore, even though it's, you might see the term gospel of the kingdom, um, which, which is, I know is only used in reference to God set up his reign on earth. Um, that's the only context in which it's used in Matthew chapter 24, as opposed to the gospel of our salvation, um, which is a little different, as I said earlier, that's the gospel that you preach now, the death, the burial, and the resurrection, that's the gospel message that's been preached today. Now, you ask the question, can we preach the gospel of the kingdom today? Yes, we can. We can tell people that God is coming to establish his kingdom on earth. He's going to rule the earth. That is the gospel of the kingdom. I mean, as opposed to the gospel of our salvation, which says how you get saved during this time in order to escape the great tribulation, so on and so forth. Um, Ella Willis, I don't know if I can go in the plane or if you want to jump in and, and help out here. So right, another a follow-up question, sir. So is it correct to say the gospel of salvation is a part of the gospel of the kingdom of God? 
Because from day one, from day one, when we look at even from the, the, the time of Adam, God, we can see where God was sitting. There was this relationship between God and man. So God ruling on the earth through man. I want to see that very, that, that connection between Let, the two. Because God now, no, I didn't no, get that part. God no, on the what, earth, man. God having a hand, like a, a, a kingdom then. The same thing about Matthew 24. Kingdom on this very earth. Or perhaps you need to clarify what was his intention from Adam's days? What was the intention of God? Was it to also rule on this earth from heaven? There needs to be a very clear um, distinction. That's why I'm asking if the gospel of salvation, which... The, 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 the purpose of it is to bring back human um, creature, well, the Lord said creature, back into relationship with God himself, getting back his spirit into us, coming back into righteousness, right living. Right. Is that a part of the gospel of the kingdom of God or are they two separate and separate in, independent um, entities? I need to understand that. Uh, let, let me let me try to and let me try to make it a little, little clearer again. Again, I must say earlier, it has to do with context. Context is very, very important when we look at scriptures, right? Now, in 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 the great tribulation time, I mean, there, there, remember now, there's going to be a lot of things being poured out on the earth. For example, the the seals gonna be open, the trumpets, the vials, people gonna be cursing God. People are going to be saying all kinds of things. And matter of fact, the Bible people go on to say that it's going to be so terrible, and but men are not going to repent. You now the Bible is going to have witnesses on the earth who are going and, and, and notice that like the fact that I said what the sister said was very powerful because what is happening is that people are going to be around during that time. That's why that terminal is just mentioned in Matthew 24. People are going to be around in that time, the two witness the 144,000 um, that are sealed in their forest, so on and so forth. And they, what the message that they're going to be preaching during that time is specifically referred to as the gospel of the kingdom. What they're saying at that time is that Jesus is about to come. So we're talking about an earthly thing. Jesus is about to come and he's going to establish a kingdom an earthly kingdom amen um where and uh, where he's going to reign and sit on the throne in jerusalem now if you're going to ask me if the, the, the gospel for salvation is a part of the the kingdom message then i would say yes it's a part of the kingdom message because we preach the gospel today to be saved but it's not the same as the gospel of the kingdom that was that, that i make reference to in matthew 24 that one was speak for a specific purpose um, I, I don't know if I can uh, hold clearer. I can't make that. Ella Willis, I'm going to say, sir, you are the future, man. <laughs> um, I I, well, let me hear if Sister Mars, if it's any clearer for Sister Mars, yeah. Um, Is it any clearer, Sister Mars, yeah? Um, I'm seeing the distinction that's being made. Um, perhaps what needs to be done is the actual context. Yes, saying to put it in context is one thing, but what is the context? So Perhaps context, that is the foundation uh, question that needs to be okay. answered. So the context is at what point? The context is the timing in which that message has been preached. That's right. The context is the timing. So the scripture specifically states in Matthew 24, because Matthew 24 have a lot to do with what, what's going to happen in the great tribulation. And the scripture is saying in the context, in that time, that message is going to be preached. So what is going to happen is that people, I said, the witnesses are going to say, boy, you see all that is happening around you now? Guess what? There's going to come a time where a man, Jesus, Christ Jesus, who was crucified 2,000 years, a couple of years ago, is going to return and is going to establish a kingdom on earth. Amen. You need to recognize what the people are not going to turn in on, but it's going to be preached, as the sister said, as a witness that they might realize that it was said that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom. But the Bible talks about the sheep and the goat judgment, I think in Matthew 25, where nations that were good to Israel are going to make it over into that millennium. But that's another term. But it does speak to the fact that there are going to be people on the earth who are going to be worshiping Jesus, come up to Jerusalem to worship him who sits on the throne on earth during the millennium time. And the nations, the Bible, and how we know that to all the nations who are not Jews, the Bible said the nations that don't come up, they're going to have famine, which means that these are not just Jews, other people. So this message is preached so that other people can recognize that Jesus is coming during the Great Tribulation and they're going to decide to either be good to Israel or not, 
because most people are going to turn away against Israel. Those that are good to Israel are going to be the sheep nations. Those that are terrible is going to be the goat nation. The sheep nation are going to make it over to worship him when he sits on the throne, the David, the fulfilling, the fulfilling of the, what is called the Davidic covenant. You know what the Davidic covenant is? That is practically David saying for a long time that somebody is going to always sit on my throne. That's right. That's right. That, that, I, that I understand, sir. Um, put in context for me, the very first message that God preached, um, the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, where the person, people in those days, they were living a particular way under certain laws and rules. And he said, for example, you are told that, look here, the, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But in my kingdom, if somebody strikes you, you turn the other cheek. You have persons who are following him because the message that he was bringing was very different in those days from even what the Levites and the Pharisees and those people were preaching. As a matter of fact, those religious orders of the day were threatened. They, were, they never, ever saw eye to eye with Jesus. And the Jews at the time, too, they contended with him. They contended with Paul. So and at that time, the persons who heard the message that Jesus himself spoke on the earth believed in him, believed in his kingdom, believed in how his kingdom operated and so on. So that is the distinction I'm trying to really get a grip on, which uh, is different I, from the kingdom, different from the, the era of the, the Matthew 24 era, okay. where you, you're going to find persons believing because, yes, mm -hmm. that message where David said, somebody will always, a ruler will always sit upon my throne that part of it is clear but i want to see the the connection between that same message that jesus taught throughout and, his, and, and, for and, the and, three years that i'm yeah. the, and the persons are coming that is what i want to grip yes. how and, that relates to what we are preaching now all right, but look at this now the gospel message that you preach the message that you preach, that we preach, repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the Holy Ghost, did not start preaching until Jesus, Jesus died, buried, and was resurrected, right? True, when, true. Right? So that, that message started during the church age. There's nobody who was before that time who was preaching um, who was preaching about that you need to baptize in Jesus' name and I get the Holy Ghost in the way that we get it. Nobody, right? Which means that for the Jews... The Jews, the gospel of the kingdom message is really for them because remember, when they look for a city whose billion maker is God, they are looking really not for a heavenly kingdom, you know, they are looking for an earthly kingdom, God setting up his kingdom in Jerusalem. But guess what? He came unto his own and his own received him not. And therefore, he has, he has now turned to the Gentiles and the Gentiles now have received him. But they are, they are different than the, church, than the Jews. The Jews is the, is the friend of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. So our kingdom is heaven. But when the Old Testament saints are resurrected, at the second part of what is called the first resurrection, their resurrection, people like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and these men, David, they're looking for is for Christ to set up his kingdom on earth. That is why when Jesus was about to go away, amen, they say, well, no, at this time, restore the kingdom unto us because in, as far as they are concerned, they know that God is going to rule sometime in Jerusalem. So if you're linking it back to when Jesus was before the death, burial, and resurrection, you're right. That was the gospel of the kingdom. That's why they say, repent for the kingdom of God is that hand. So if you're looking at it from that context, you're you very right. It was the same message. But the, mess, the gospel of our salvation started to preach after the church was established on the day of Pentecost. Amen. Beautiful. Okay. Amen. That's very Thank clear. you. Can I just put just a, a little touch on that? Yes, my daughter. Go ahead. Okay. So just as um, Minister Martin said before, is that um, what one of the things I think that is that causes uh, some confusion sometimes is the fact that the prophets of old they prophesy and mountain peaks of prophecy. So they are on like one peak to an next peak. So they did not see the church in the valley. So That's the right. church is God, like a, Jesus, like a private thing, that new, that, that little mystery. secret thing, That's that mystery. <laughs> and so yeah. that is why you now when, when you try to put the church and, and, and the, prophet, the prophetic utterance about the kingdom, together there comes confusion. Right. Because they, right. Don't, they don't seem to understand that this, this, this awesome thing that God did when the, the time lapse between, between the, the seventh 
the, 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 the Daniel weeks to the last right. week. The sixth night and the seventh week. Yes. And the seventh week. That time, like, when the church come in, in that time, that's where now, when, you know, many times you hear the pre, many people use the message from, use um, Matthew 24 as part of the church. And that's church. where. Yes. That's yes, where the that, that's true. From, but that, that, there's a principle we learn in hermeneutics we call it the ethnic division principle, where it's important that you, you understand who God is talking to. And if yes. you start to mix up what is for the church, for Israel, and what is for and, Israel, that's right. where a lot of prophecy people get it wrong. And they, they, that they is the problem. What that is, is in the problem. To the church is applied to Israel. What is for Israel is applied to the church, and they put everything in one basket, which is not necessarily true. Yeah, yeah, the ethnic division principle, what it does, it says you need to identify who God is who talking to. What he's saying, what yes. he's saying, and for, to whom is he speaking. Exactly. And that, that that distinction is clear. The, the final point I'll make, and then I'll go and give other persons a chance. The So on the new earth, because there is going to be a new earth that the Lord is going to make without sea, right? So yes, the Lord will set up his kingdom in um, Jerusalem and so on, interim, as an interim. And why I ask the question about um, the time of Adam and God's intent to have relationship directly with humans, in the new dispensation, the final dispensation, God himself will be our ruler on a new physical earth and heaven, right? But he will, he will leave heaven and come down on this new earth, which will not have sea. Yes? So his, he will eventually be ruling directly, being the king of kings. Yes? Mm -hmm. King of us kings on that new earth without mm -hmm. sea. Correct? So that's that, right. so, that's so what, when that's what his revelation, to, I think, that's 20. what Revelation yeah. says. Yeah, so, 21. why I was asking all of this and the connection and so on, I'm aware of the, dis, the difference in terms of who God is speaking to, when and how, and times of the prophets and what have you. And the Lord brought all of that together in the configuration and all of that. So, I was just trying to make sure that um, what Jesus himself came and what he was teaching during his time uh that puts into context even what we're preaching today because it's not different yes that is what that is the, the the clarification that i wanted and i think i've got it thank you all right sister camille had a had her hand up would you come on in sister camille god bless you sir bless you brother martin i'm a quick question in Revelation 14, it speaks about the angels preaching an everlasting gospel. Is this everlasting gospel the gospel of the kingdom? And is it that they will be coming down on earth to preach the everlasting gospel? The Bible tell you what the everlasting gospel was in that in Revelation chapter 14. It, I think it's three things. It tell you that you need to fear God. Um, let, me, let me go back to it. So Revelation 14, the scripture actually tell you what it was. And I guess the, the everlasting gospel, it's called the everlasting gospel because it's in reference to from, 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 it, from eternity, past to eternity, future. Amen. Um, so the, it tells you what the everlasting gospel is. Remember that 14 you mentioned, right? Yes. Yes, correct. Uh, let me look for it. But it, it tell you what it was. Say what a Lord was, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his. And I saw an angel in the midst of heaven crying, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto all that dwell on the earth and every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And he told you what he was saying with a loud voice, one fear God, give glory to him for our judgments is going to worship him that made war in heaven and earth. So there are three things that are in reference to what the everlasting gospel is. You must fear God, you give him glory and you worship him. And, and that's, that is the everlasting gospel. It's everlasting because it goes from eternity past to eternity future. So from ever from time past to time future, everybody is supposed to have fear, reverence for God, everybody's supposed to worship God, and everybody's supposed to that 13 that it says there. Not looking at the verse now, but that's what practically what the everlasting gospel is. It is not the same as the gospel of the kingdom. Different terminologies again. Okay, clear. Thank you. No problem. All right. Any other question? Any other question? Going once, gone twice. All right, thank you. See, see, it's the Ella Willis. These, these people are scared me now because when, when <laughs> people from Ella, <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go. All right, all right, don't worry about it. <laughs> praise God, praise God. Bye. God bless. Learn God. people, I better put more. <laughs>
time. <laughs> give us thanks again. And God bless you. Sir. God bless you, saints. Let us raise our hands for the benediction as we go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now unto him who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. And all God's people say, amen and amen. God bless you, saints. God bless you. Thanks for joining. And see you on Tuesday night, God's willing, as we continue to lift up the name of Jesus. Have a wonderful night. In Jesus' name.